the forced heroism of the survivor. For most of her life, Virginia Woolf suffered from what she called looking-glass shame, an aversion to seeing herself in mirrors. She wrote about it late in her career, not long before her suicide, recalling that the trouble began with one particular mirror. It hung in the hall of her family home, and when she was about six, her half-brother Gerald Duckworth lifted her onto a nearby table and put his hands under her clothes. Wolfe's other half-brother, George Duckworth, also began molesting her a few years later, paying her almost nightly visits for a time. She would go on to speak and write publicly about the abuse, which continued into her twenties, even confronting George, but mirrors continued to distress her. It is so difficult, she wrote, with uncharacteristic and moving awkwardness, to give any account of the person to whom things happen. The question of what posture to take toward our own pain is unexpectedly complicated. How do we understand our own suffering, with what words and to what ends? Does great suffering always diminish us? These are the kinds of currents swirling around the word survivor, the increasingly popular term for people who have experienced sexual violence. Commonly used to describe those who had endured the Holocaust, the word was picked up by feminist groups organizing against the sexual abuse of children in the 1980s and has since broadened in scope and gone mainstream. At the Academy Awards in February, Lady Gaga performed her Oscar-nominated song for The Hunting Ground, a documentary about campus rape, accompanied by 50 men and women who had been assaulted, their arms painted with words like survivor. A day later, she spoke out about being raped as a teenager. 51, surviving and thriving, she captioned a group photograph on Instagram. On social media, People post messages of support to themselves or others with the hashtag hash survivor level etter. You are not what they took from you, one woman writes to her younger self. You are the monument of survival and recovery you erected in its place, you are a queen. The word has caught on with law enforcement, the Department of Justice and the White House Task Force on Campus Safety, we are here to tell sexual assault survivors that they are not alone its first report announced in 2014. A Survivor's Rights Act intended to empower survivors to make more informed decisions throughout the criminal justice process and demanding longer preservation of rape kits, among other things, was recently introduced in the Senate. The evolving legal definition of rape has always been a bellwether of changing attitudes to race and gender and the legitimacy of survivor signals a subtle but important shift in thinking about sexual violence. The historian Estelle B. Friedman has argued that the story of rape in America consists in large part in tracking the changing narratives that define which women may charge which men with the crime of forceful, unwanted sex and whose accounts will be believed. But, with a few exceptions, there have been few historical records of how victims of violence have named and understood their own experiences. After all, for much of history, the good rape victim, the credible rape victim has always been a dead one, a serviceable symbol of defiled innocence around whom a group can rally, a suicide like Lucretia, whose rape catalyzed the founding of the Roman Republic, or any of the Catholic Church's patron saints of rape victims none of whom, incidentally, were raped, they martyred themselves instead. In literature, women have been ingeniously silenced, in Ovid's metamorphoses, they're turned into birds and trees. One has her tongue cut out to keep her from testifying, a grisly and beloved rope that reappears everywhere from Titus Andronicus to the world according to Garp. But beginning in the 1970s, books like Kiss Daddy Goodnight, I Never Told Anyone and The Courage to Heal, which collected first-person narratives of women who had experienced incest and child sexual abuse, brought the issue to the fore of public consciousness. They were among the first to pointedly use the word survivor, often replacing victim in a form of deliberate rebranding to emphasize women's resourcefulness rather than their helplessness and the decisions they had made that allowed them to stay safe and sane. But what once felt radical has blossomed into a rhetoric of almost mandatory heroism. I'm not a victim, I'm a survivor is the common refrain from women like Trisha Mealy, the jogger whose rape in Central Park in 1989 roiled the city, 
and the actress Gabrielle Union, raped at gunpoint at 19, I hated feeling like a victim, she said, it makes you lazy. Others prefer Thriver, even Warrior. There appears to be such an insistence on toughness that it's impossible to think of a book like Alice Sebold's memoir of her rape, Lucky, being marketed today as it was in 1999. The flap copy calls her attack the crime from which no woman can ever really recover. Tell that to Jessica Jones, Imperator Furiosa from the Mad Max, Fury Road comic book, Lisbeth Salander from The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, Olivia Benson from Law and Order, Special Victims Unit, The Bride in Kill Bill. The Survivor, or pop culture's fantasy of her, now cuts a distinctive silhouette, she's damaged but never so much as to be a figure of pity or revulsion, her wound makes her interesting, even alluring. Where the victim was abject, a figure of shame and isolation, the survivor is lithe and frequently well-armed. She is a little scary and a little sexy, and her rage feels divinely sanctioned, sanctioned, 